Hello and welcome to The Gist. I'm your host, Chris Petrano, here every week to break down all the things that are happening in pop culture and interviewing the people that make it pop. On today's show, it's another pop culture roundup where we're going to cover all the biggest stories of the month. And wow, a lot is going on. So um, I can't wait to get into all of that. Um, And then... In preparation of the new season of The Real Housewives of New Jersey, my guest and I are going to face off to share the two sides of the Melissa versus Teresa feud that keeps on giving. My hope today is that we can heal the nation. And I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Um, But without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest because she is no stranger to the podcast and also no stranger to pop culture. She's beauty. She's grace. Though she doesn't always have the best Real Housewives of New Jersey taste, please welcome Emily Vecchio. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me back. I'm going to let the shade roll off. And my <laughs> only hope is that we're still friends after this podcast. I know. Well, that's why I said heal the nation. I was like, we might need to heal ourselves before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we're healing each other. We're yes. healing, you know, this deep, deep wound that we carry. Yes, because one of us is Team Melissa and the other one is Wrong. right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, love it. Um, <laughs> but before we get into that, obviously, uh, April was a pop culture month and the headlines were really what we're giving. And there's some that we're going to talk about here in a bit um, that I know you're very excited about. But before we do, maybe not so excited. The, of course, the big news is we got the new Taylor Swift album. And I know this isn't exciting for you, but you have like been coming around. I'm not trying to get the Swifties to come for you, but you've been coming around on Taylor. So I know you've listened to pretty much the whole album, at least the last time I talked to you. I did. What are your thoughts? Uh, I I have to preface with I'm not a Swiftie and I'm terrified of the fan base. Absolutely (laughs) terrified. As you should be. Present company excluded. You You are one of the few Swifties. But I, you know, I'm not afraid of you, but yeah. I, I, I want to get it. I want to like it. I love this stuff. Like I love the drama. I love the feuds. I love pop culture. So I want to be involved in the discourse and I want to understand it, but I just, I don't get it. And I, I, I don't know if it's me, like maybe it's just not for me, Right. but I did try. I did try. I sat down this week. The album came out. I heard from reliable friends of mine, you included, that it was worth listening to. Absolutely. Give the music a shot, put the tailor out of it and just listen to the music. Two bops. Two bops. I got two two bops out of it. I like but daddy uh, but daddy I love him. Mhm. I can do it with a broken heart. Yes. We got two fun songs. The rest of the songs I just I couldn't really make heads or tail of the entire album. It was a little bit of a a struggle to get through because it was so lyrically heavy so lyrically heavy not a lot of like (laughs) melody to grab onto not I I just couldn't really sink my teeth into anything right so I don't at this point I'm just feeling like it's not for me maybe it's just not for me but I I want I want to be there I want to get over the line we're we're gonna get you there but I think that you're right I mean I, I actually saw online someone said that they felt like the album was written by chat gpt <laughs> um, there's so many lyrics. <laughs> well, it's funny because some of the AI songs were ironically catchier than <laughs> what was on the album. I know. And, you know, and listen, like, I, I mean, it was nice of you to put me in the Swifty category. I love some Taylor Swift. I, every album, I have a song or several or an entire collection of songs that I love. But I will say that, like, we are getting a lot of Taylor. And when I listened to the 31 tracks from the entire anthology, it was a lot. And I didn't know if we needed all of them because some of them started to sound the same. Some of them I was like, I feel like I've heard this on like either Midnight's or Folklore or Evermore. Like I was like, I feel like we're recycling some of these songs. And I know that she's telling her story and Swifties would come for me because like, this is her story right now. And these are her lyrics. And this is like her telling her thing. but. I actually thought like if we took all of the best tracks from the 31, we could have actually had like a bit of a stronger album overall because on, even on the actual like original album before she surprise released the additional double album, um, it was like, 
I know there was just like, I think that like the first half of the like original album is really strong and then it kind of falls off for me. But then there's a couple of the like bonus tracks or whatever we're calling it that I feel like are, um, I just am like, those should have been a part of the regular album. And then we could have had a really strong, just like one album. I don't know if we needed 31 more Taylor tracks after everything that she's given us. 31 songs is a lot. There's not many people that can pull off 31 songs and you're going to listen to all 31 and be like, I needed all of those. But I, but that's who it's for, right? right. Exactly right. who you said. It's for the deep Swifties. It's for the people that love her and are diehard fans of hers and just want to hear her point of view on everything that's gone on in her life in the last however many years since she put on an album. Like that's who this is for. And yeah. it's brilliant in terms of a business money-making machine yeah. because she just – there's just so much public interest in her life and who she's dating and her breakups and how she feels about everything. And she doesn't do interviews. She doesn't put herself out there. Yeah. She, it's just all of this interest and all of her fans are just on the edge of their seats waiting for the album because they want to hear what she has, has to say. So yeah. it makes sense why it's just kind of like, you know, written word poured into beats. I won't yeah. call them boring <laughs> because, you know, it's, yeah, I don't. It, you know, that, no. Those I are need. It's, I need it's, some Taylor bops, though. I need like my my pop girly. I need her to like, you know, deliver some beats and some something fun. I want to dance again to Taylor, and I'm not getting that right now. Who doesn't want to dance? Exactly. But it's it's a little like I wonder if this is like where she's going from here because her fans her her fan base is so diehard that they will feast on anything she does. Like she doesn't have to put out a pop album. Right. People will just salivate at like the tiniest thing that she does. She's unstoppable. So, yeah. It's like, she doesn't even have to, like she doesn't even have to put out a bop. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, but you know, who does give us bops and even today is the Spice Girls. And so we also have to talk about my favorite Spice Girl of all time, Victoria Beckham, originally Victoria Adams, a.k.a. Posh Spice. Uh, she turned 50 uh, this month, and uh, she got all of the girls back together at her party, and uh, her husband uh, did the Lord's work by bringing us their reunion and then uh, delivering the stop performance from her 50th birthday. Tell me your thoughts. Oh, I mean, Victoria and David Beckham, king and queen. Just king and queen, mom and mom dad. And dad. <laughs> mom, mommy, daddy. Yeah. <laughs> emphasis on daddy. Yes. But I that I mean, talk about pop girlies. I can get excited. And about. emphasis but, on mommy too. And oh my mommy, god. I know. I loved their the documentary that they did, and you see just how like yeah. silly and goofy they are, and not these like kind of serious people. But I just seeing all five of them doing the stop dance together yeah. all these years later, all looking just phenomenal and fabulous. That I mean, for me, that was just like a warm hug. That was Ugh. just like basking in the glow of like such a glorious time. It just tells me that I need more. More, more. And I feel like they're the perfect people to give us more. Yes. Because there was like, did they ever fight? Like, was there a falling out between the five of them? Well, I mean, obviously, Jerry left the group. Right, and it oh, was right. the four Jerry of them. Left. The, the world fell apart. Yeah, the world fell apart. And then they released one more album and it, they like, pivoted too much and people just were like yeah the band fell apart like it's not it's not the same magic and but then like I don't know I, I mean I guess like Victoria went on to become like a massive like fashion yeah. designer and star and you know they all started doing their solo projects and so you know it it took shape in a different way but I mean I'm ready for their return and you know some of them have been saying that it is coming and that whatever they're going to deliver us is going to be all five of them. I'm just hoping that what they've been hinting at wasn't this moment that we just got <laughs> like a imagine? little, <laughs> it was just, they're like, like we just are all going to the video. same party. <laughs> <laughs> it was just four seconds of them doing this. They actually like literally <laughs> paid David Beckham to take that video. Cause they're like, this is our reunion. <laughs> Thank God for him. What would we do without him? Oh. Just like being such a dad. I hope that we never have to find out. Um, but now like a couple of other like quick takes, I just want to get your thoughts on, um, I mean, I don't know if this is like a sad news, like, I don't know. Death is, death is always sad, I guess, but OJ Simpson died in this last month. And I mean, it's a, it's a weird one, right? We've got Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Jenner tweets, good riddance. 
I mean, people are very torn because obviously this is a very polarizing person of pop culture who has now been, who is now deceased. Tell me your thoughts. It's a toughie. It's a toughie because you don't want to speak ill of the dead, obviously, but there is a, there's a reality, which is that I think at this point we can deduce that he, he did it right. Right. Like we can say allegedly for whatever to, you know, protect everyone, but he did it. He's, he's borderline admitted it. You know, he wrote the book. If I did it, right. He's, it's just, it's kind of obvious. Well, he glorified it. He like, glorified it. He makes jokes about it. Like he's so unserious about it that it's like, obviously he did. He landed himself in prison one way or the other where he should have been all along. Yeah. You know, he wound up having to pay all the, you know, the family of Nicole and the, mm-hmm. um, and Ron, all of that money because they found him still responsible. Like he did it. Yeah. So as a society, it's like, I, yeah, it's, it's a tough spot because he's gone, you know, right. so he's not capable of, doing anything else, you know, that's harmful to anyone. So it's, it's, it's good to kind of finally be rid of that, that burden that I'm sure a lot of people around him have felt for a really long time. And I'm sure that her family feels like, you know, maybe some sense of relief that he's finally gone, but yeah, it's like, how do you mourn somebody that you were, were pretty certain did these horrible, some, something completely unconscionable. Yeah. And of course, like there was a point in time in which he was like a celebrated athlete and, you know, he sure. was this like, you know, maybe American hero in some ways, but that is certainly not the legacy that he leaves. And so, you know, it, and like you said, he, he wrote the book, if I had done it or whatever. And, you know, he glorified this horrible thing that happened and made jokes about it. And, you know, so he, he is now no longer with us for better or worse. And that happened in April. So we, we had to acknowledge it, but I don't know that like there's anywhere more to go with it. No, I did see though that there was a big spike in Bronco sales. So, oh. like, if there's any legacy to be left, it's the Bronco chase. Well, it, an American car company certainly needs the help, I'm sure. <laughs> so they're they're probably loving it. Yeah, I'm sure Ford is thrilled. They're the only ones celebrating. Um, speaking of controversial characters, another incident that happened uh, this month uh, here in our hometown, uh, Morgan Wallen a name I really swore I was never going to bring up on this podcast, to be honest, but um, Morgan Wallen is at it again. He was uh, drunk on one of the rooftop bars downtown. I think Eric church is like chief's bar um, and six stories up through a chair off the top of the roof and got arrested. Um, and I think he's facing like three different charges for, uh, for it. Um, Good. I hope they're all felonies. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, when will, when will we or when will something happen so that this person like stops acting poorly? I know. When will we be done? When will we be done with him? Because he doesn't care. He really doesn't care. He's gotten away with this type of stuff since the beginning. I haven't followed his career that closely because I'm not a fan of his. Right. But he makes headlines because he's so popular in the country world. He's so popular and it blows my mind because what I do hear about him are just horrible, horrible things. I mean, he's yep. horrible things. I mean, all know the the horrible slurs that he's, you know, said in the past without any remorse, cancel shows right before he goes out on stage. So he doesn't give a shit about his fans. And then, I mean, throwing a chair off of the top of a five-story building, he's very, very lucky that nobody died or was injured. Yeah. I so, mean, imagine if someone had, I mean, maybe that would have actually like, finally taught him a lesson but like you know obviously i I don't wish for that to have happened but it's like yeah he it's like very similar to the oj thing it's like he almost glorifies the fact that he gets in this trouble and like his career just gets even wildly more successful and he like so he enjoys doing it now it's like he wants to be this like bad person and he like when he was smiling in his mugshot it was like almost like he knew like oh yeah nothing's gonna happen to me yeah i'm just doing a photo shoot there's no consequences so what really like what is there for him to learn he faces no consequences and the backlash that he does get his fan base just ultimately flips it and makes him this like pariah and makes him almost like a victim to criticism but it, it's, he's not, yeah, he, it just blows my mind. It blows my mind how somebody like him who's so reckless with what he says and what he does just continues to be propped up as this 
you know, really successful, famous guy. And yeah. I mean, all things aside, it's like his, his music isn't even that good. No, I mean, people like for whatever reason, like say they love it. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't like a, it's not a, I mean, I'm sorry. It's not a Taylor Swift situation. It's not a Garth Brooks. It's not like this like massive entertainer that like has the stage presence and all the things like he is not any of those things and truly is riding on the coattails of these like horrific things that he has done. And for some reason, the industry keeps protecting him because I mean, I will tell you, I have heard some crazy stories. Maybe you have too, um, about things that he has done around town and like his managers and the, the team around him, the way that they protect these, like, I mean, crazy, crazy things that have happened. And I just like, I can't, I can't believe that he just keeps doing it. But here he is throwing chairs off of six story balconies and, you know, as if that's just another day. I mean, it's for him, it's just another headline. (laughs) That's going to come and go and and he's going to be over it. And I'm sure a very short amount of time. But I was just going to say the same thing, like living here, you hear a lot of stories about him just being a loser, an idiot, a piece of shit to people. And really just kind of like being a mess and being a train wreck. So it's totally unsurprising that he did something that unhinged. But yeah, it's like, it's, it's sad when you get to the point where somebody's going to have to get seriously hurt for him to even feel the impact of his decisions and the weight of his choices. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've given him enough breath on this episode, but um, but speaking of throwing things, the time <laughs> has come, okay? Because there have been some wild headlines this month, all of which are celebrating a 90s pop culture queen that I love. Of course, I'm talking about Miss Tori Spelling, <laughs> but our Tori has been through it. Now, okay, she has been, I mean, this is, no, we're no... We're not new to these Tory Spelling headlines, but some of the ones that we got this month are wild, wild. Um, so Man. I don't even know where to start because she uh, she announces she's getting divorced. Uh, she th- throws a, bit, a loaded baked potato at her. <laughs> her, her I'm trying ex. not to talk over you, but I just, I can't. The headline of her throwing a baked potato, (laughs) opening up the article to read that it was a Wendy's fully loaded baked potato. (laughs) And that's what was the straw that broke the camel's back of a long ass marriage. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) it's why, I mean, that is a headline for the ages. (laughs) I just, I mean, I died when I remember telling you about it and you were like, you didn't believe, you didn't believe that that was like a real story that we were. And then I sent you the um, headline is Tori Spelling through baked potato in final fight with Dean McDermott. <laughs> final fight. I mean, and to be clear, if Joe ever throws a baked loaded baked potato at me, I, I'm yeah filing for divorce. That it's day. over. It's and over. mostly because like that was a perfectly good baked potato. <laughs> you don't just throw potatoes. You I don't mean, just waste a Wendy's baked potato. No, absolutely not. That is what? fireable. Uh, her Tori Spelling and like food seems to be a very dangerous situation well, <laughs> because it wasn't that long ago that she fell into a hibachi grill. I mean, which is another crazy <laughs> headline. And if you really think about that in practice, sounds very painful. Oh my god, that's a I mean, huge hot grill. Hor- horrible. It's I a mean, hot plate. Yes, it was. You know, years ago, Tori Spelling falls on the Benihana hibachi grill. I mean, that is a headline for the ages, but now here she is delivering again. So just also, so first she also has a podcast with Dean, but apparently they have decided like that podcast is over because so is their marriage. So she (laughs) announces her new podcast, Miss Spelling. Great name. Phenomenal name. Oh yeah. Amazing. And the first episode is apparently her. I didn't listen to it. Did you hear any of it? No, I didn't listen to it, but okay. I did read what she did. I read like, cause I think in the article too, it quoted the, the transcript. Yeah. So you may know even better than I, but she essentially like announces that she's going to divorce him by calling him and recording the conversation for the podcast. Ambushed him on the podcast. Ambushed oh. him to decide who was going to file. <laughs> Who's going to file first. <laughs> And okay, so since you did actually like do the research, 
is this pre baked potato or was this after? I couldn't quite make heads or tails of the timeline. It sounds like there was a final blowout that resulted in her <laughs> throwing the baked potato, which the way that she describes it, like was this glorified, which it is. I mean, a baked potato is a pretty, you know, iconic side dish yes, um, or main dish, depending on, you know, what you like. But yeah. it, it was like, she was like, this was fully loaded. It had all the fixings, all the toppings. Like this was the most glorious baked potato. And for her to throw it was something that she was really pushed to the edge to do. And she describes <laughs> potato being everywhere. So it must have been fresh, like a fresh potato to just splatter and potato everywhere. Well, and you know, those Wendy's baked potatoes have like the, that like nacho cheese sauce oh, and things. I mean, so this so is a good. messy. Sometimes they have chili on them. Like it could have been just disastrous, which is what she describes, a disaster scene where potato and all the fixings just like land all over the place. I think it results in her then locking her and her kids in her room because this fight was so out of control. So they decide to divorce and then she goes to report, record her podcast and opens with an ambush to her husband calling him on the phone, ask, saying, I think I'm the one that's entitled to file. Oh, I mean. Could you imagine? It's wild. It's wild. I mean, do you feel like you need to step up your game? Because this is what's going on in the podcast world. People are calling their husbands and asking for a divorce. I mean, yeah. Who should we call right now? I feel like, like we what should. Are we, what do we do? Who are we surprising? Why don't we have a surprise call? Why aren't we calling Teresa and Melissa right now? Like, <laughs> yeah. What's her number? Get them on so the I can pod. tell her I want her to be fired. <laughs> um. Yeah, that – it's just – it's so wild. And, I mean, they have had, like, such a journey with this, like – whole uh marriage i mean yeah. like i feel like they've divorced several times i might they be have. wrong like they may not have fully divorced but they like separated for sure it's been tumultuous on and off i haven't followed the entire thing i remember i think it started i can't was it the podcast that started over them like unpacking his cheating on her. Yeah. Well, they there had like reality shows show. too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was the show. I, he cheated on her. They were like very public about them trying to work through the reconciliation. And maybe he like admitted to being a sex addict or something. And then they had the show. It, it seems like it's been tumultuous and a lot. I wonder after all these years, like what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Like, you've been in this super long, tumultuous relationship. They have so many kids. They have, like, five kids. And like what, what at this point is making you throw a baked potato? <laughs> and, I mean, okay, and this, I'm not saying that this is the reason, because, and, and I love Tori. I, Donna Martin love will her. forever be one of the greatest icons of my childhood. But, like, there are some wild things that come out of, about her, and... She really wants to be a real housewife. Like, she has made that very clear. What? But, oh, do you not know this? No, but I, the way I support that decision. Well, she and Jenny Garth were on Watch What Happens Live. Like, this is years ago. And she, like, basically, like, confronted Andy and was like, why have you never made me a housewife? Like, I have asked to be a housewife. <laughs> and That's then. So funny. It's like, and Andy is <laughs> just kind of like, oh, yeah, just like never worked out. Like, you know, he's trying to kind of just like, like calm it down and then it is revealed and i think andy did this on purpose because i think he didn't know he didn't think tori knew this and I, she may not have that jenny garth was asked was she and she turned it down and oh. andy brought it up and i was like oh no these two who are like i mean they are still besties as far as we know i was like oh this is it this is ending it for tori she cannot believe her ears Kelly I Taylor. Have to go back and watch, I have to go back and watch this Watch What Happen, Happens Live yeah. because I didn't see that. But I never thought about that. I think she is the perfect choice for Tori a housewife. Or Jenny. Yeah, I think she's what the franchise kind of needs right now because she's had a very interesting life. She grew up, you know, super rich, the son of Aaron, the daughter of Aaron Spelling. Yeah. All the drama with the family. She's had this really tumultuous marriage. She's no stranger to drama. So she's got that kind of like foot in the door with the glamorous Hollywood life, but she's got nothing to lose. And she is so not afraid to be chaotic and like get in the mix and do the job of stirring some some stuff up. Yeah. I mean, there is a bit of like a Kim Zolciak vibe of it all where like, you know, and I think the other thing that, and Andy has said this not about Tori, but I think about other people is like when they want it too bad, 
like producers don't love yeah. that because no, then they don't true. feel like they, they feel like they're going to come in to produce the show. They're going to come in with like, I, I know it so well. I want it so bad. I know what character I'm going to play. I know all of the, my lines and I think you've thought about it too much. And those like those housewives don't come across as like super authentic and real. That's true. And I think that's maybe what happened with Marlo and mm-hmm. why it didn't really work out with Marlo is that she just wanted it too bad mm-hmm. that she was just hitting way too below the belt and it didn't land and it was just too much. Well, and I think that's honestly what happened on like Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip with the New York Legacy. Like all of those women, the Dorindas, the Countess Luans, the Sonias, they're dying to be back on the show right. and they're like, give me the camera and I will stage my comeback. But then it's all so forced and it's like all so much that it's like, it's it's just overwhelming and it doesn't read as like this authentic thing. Like those are people that if they just show up as themselves, we love them. We love a Dorinda making it nice. We love Countess Luann thinking she's a pop diva. Like we love those things. You don't have to go and be a persona because you think that's what the audience is wanting. And I think that's like too staged. And I think that's maybe where like a Tory Spelling would fall flat on Housewives. It could be a, it could be a risk. I think on Beverly Hills, it's worth a shot. Well, we, we need some, we need some fresh blood on Beverly Hills. So who knows? Maybe this is her time. Maybe the baked potato headline is exactly what the producers needed to go. This you. sounds like, because this is the one thing I will say, Kathy Hilton is so popular as a housewife and character. And I kind of feel like Tori has some of those Kathy Hilton mm-hmm. vibes. Like she's a little like, okay, one of the other headlines we haven't talked about yet is that she revealed she can't pee or poop uh, in <laughs> private. <laughs> so she um, has her children poor, watch poor her. Beau. Poor she has Beau. her children come into the, the <laughs> bathroom because she, she wears can't. their diapers. And she wore, that was another headline. Yeah, she wore their diapers. No, it's never ending. We could literally be here for another 45 minutes talking about this alone. But I I do think Kathy Hilton, though, is an example of somebody who is very self-produced but is disguising it. Right. No. So. And doing it well, though. Doing She's doing it well. She's doing it well. This sort of weird little character that she's playing, I think some of it's true, but I think a lot of it is, you know, the Paris Hilton school of reality TV, where it's this sort of little bit of this, like, you know bimbo persona that's kind of making you feel a little bit more relatable than you actually are absolutely yeah no i think i think you're right i think she knows her marks and but she hits them well yeah and if you hit them all i think lisa rinna was the same way i think lisa rinna really wanted to be a housewife she came on she produced the show she knew her how to be a soap star and she brought that you know she gave us iconic moments i mean the amsterdam moment is one of the best housewives moment the Asking Dorit if people were doing coke in the bathroom, one of the Best. most iconic moments. Uh, tell, telling Denise Richards, oh, you're so angry. Oh, you're so angry. Yeah, I mean, iconic. So, you know, it's like when it lands, it lands. And then like when it doesn't, it really doesn't. Yeah. Um, and I was like... I, Go ahead. Selfishly, I just kind of want to see the rest of the Beverly Hills women interact with Tori Spelling. Well, and I think that there's actually some like natural ties. I think that like, Maybe it's Kyle. I mean, Kyle would make sense. I think like is friends with Tori too. So like, and because Tori, I mean, you will have to go watch this, watch what happens live because Tori like gives her pitch to Andy and is like, I've asked for it. And like, you know, I'm friends with Kyle. I know this person. I I do these (laughs) things. I host wild parties. I, you know, she like went on like a, why are you not bringing me on? (laughs) That's so funny. I have to watch that. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I mean, that's probably a perfect segue because there is some Bravo news that we have to just dissect. Um, lots of cast shakeups. So my last episode, I went through the top 10 things that I felt like Bravo should do because I feel like Bravo is in a need of some resuscitation in some ways. There's some things falling a little flat. And I, I went through, one of them was I went through and said which housewives I thought should not return or should not um, be offered another contract. And literally right after I recorded the podcast, Bravo just started making all of these casting announcements that were like insane and all this Mm -hmm. news was dropping. So, I mean, how, I mean, I don't even know where to start because there is so much, but I guess like from a casting perspective, what has been shocking to you? What are you, who are you excited to hear was leaving? Who are you excited to see back? It was a a little bit of a bloodbath um, because they announced a lot at once. So it was a lot to process. 
Potomac had, it seemed like the biggest shakeup. Yes. Where and it, needed were, it. it needs it. It really needs it. So, but I have mixed feelings though about the direction that they chose to go in. Robin absolutely agree. Had to go. Yeah. I, I I don't think they should have even brought Robin back this season because she Well, I think committed. the cheating thing brought her back. <laughs> I think that she was filming because I had heard last before this last season that she was gonna be a friend of Giselle. And just be like a side player. But I think that because all the one stuff happened, that it like amplified her storyline. Which I get it, but I don't because she had already committed like the ultimate reality TV show sin, which is she withheld. She withheld the most like dramatic thing that was happening in her life. The thing that is the reason why everybody's tuning in, which you know, it's a little, I get why, you know, it's obviously her life and maybe that sort of thing is really sensitive, Yeah. but why go back then? If you're not going to talk about what's really going on in your life with Juan, who has been a character on the show too, since the beginning and their yeah. relationship and whether they were going to get remarried and everything they had been through financially and their, you know, road to coming back together and getting remarried again, like that has been the central premise to her being on the show. And so yeah. withholding all of that stuff I think she should not have even been given an offer to come back because yeah. what the hell are we doing? And then she came and did the exact same thing. She's not honest about her relationship with Juan. So I, I don't even think it's like fair to put her firing in the same category as someone like Candace. Yeah. You know, it's like Robin should have been gone a long time ago. So not sad about that one. I'm a little sad to see Candace go. Although now hearing that she's pregnant, I'm happy for her peace and her like mental health yeah. that she's not going to film. But I hope she comes back after she has a baby and i think she'll be a bit of a portia a bit. like yeah. i think she'll be a portia in that way where like i don't think the door is closed for her whereas like robin i do think the door is probably closed but candace i think it's like okay let her you know go have her baby let her kind of like focus on that and let her get like reset because she was she didn't deliver this season she like didn't give us a lot she was unwilling to move things forward and you know it it was time for her to go in that way. I was a little surprised though, because I also called for Ashley and Wendy. I think I said they need to go as well. And they have not announced that they are going and got cam- cameras are picking up again next week. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not totally surprised about Ashley because it, it seems like they want to keep the Karen Giselle Ashley dynamic intact. Yeah. Which I could go either way on Ashley. Like, I don't really love her. I don't connect with her. I think she's nuts. I think she's really (laughs) deceitful, too, about her life and doesn't share and isn't really that honest. Um, But so I could kind of go either way on her, but I kind of get why they're keeping the three of them together. And maybe they're just going to rebuild around these three OGs that are still there. But why Wendy, I don't understand. Wendy just, Wendy's a little bit of like a sad character to me. I don't. I, I love her. I think her kids are really sweet. I think her relationship with Eddie is is sweet, but I don't, I just don't feel like she knows who she is. And so it's a little kind of tough to watch her keep trying to evolve into all these different businesses and these different styles and all of this different stuff. And it's like, where was the Wendy that, you know, Dr. Wendy that right. we got when she first came on? Like, I loved that Wendy. I loved, you know, three yeah. degree, three degree Wendy. So I don't, I'm just confused why they kept Wendy. Yeah, That's the only thing that's confusing to me. Well, and she, without Candace, she really doesn't have anyone. So, you know, it's like, she's going to have to, I guess, go to the Giselle side. I mean, I don't know where Mm -hmm. she goes. So yeah, it feels a little, a little strange that we didn't like go all the way. Like we were going to shake up the cast. Let's really shake it up and like change it. But it seems like they only took out a couple that I feel like we needed to sort of clean house a little bit. Um, And then, you know, the other thing that has been talked about, and Bravo and Andy have both, you know, denied these rumors, but there is like a lot percolating about Bravo's putting together, I think it was like In Touch or Us Weekly, I think it was In Touch, that they reported that Bravo was putting together the exit package for Andy Cohen um, and that he was finally going to be stepping down amid all the lawsuits and all the like allegations that have come out about him and that they were feeling like this was his time to go and this was all in the midst of all these other firings and casting changes and things that are being announced as well what how do you respond to that i mean okay they're in a little bit of a tough spot because 
the housewife franchises right now, I think we can all agree, are falling a tad flat. Yes. They're falling a little bit flat. It's a lot of sort of just we're watching because we're invested in these people that we've been invested in for a really long time. But the shows aren't really what they used to be. But I do not want to see the House of Cards crumble. I really don't. And I think if we remove Andy, it's the beginning of the end. So I really don't want to see him go personally, selfishly. Like if the worst thing he's done is offer someone cocaine, just color me jealous. Like I want to be backstage at Watch What Happens Live with Andy coming up to me, you know, offering me alcohol and drugs. That's what I want. So I'm not going to, it's hard for me to sympathize with the people who are upset about this and upset about him. He's shady. He is absolutely shady. He 100% plays favorites. You can see it on his talk show on Watch What Happens Live. But he's, I'm just thinking about this now though. It's like he's put himself in a very difficult position because all of his disgruntled employees that he fires are people that have built success on being unhinged and being Mm -hmm. dramatic and taking big swings to create drama. So these are the people that are probably behind these rumors, obviously behind the lawsuits. Like it's probably all Bethany. That's I'm sure it's Bethany like planting stories being like, you know, this is it. Andy's done. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I, I agree with you a bit in that, like if Andy goes, it all sort of crumbles. Uh, but I don't know. But I also, there's like a side of it where I'm like, I see Andy getting tired and getting irritable and things at reunions where it like doesn't make it as fun to watch when he like gets too invested in those, in the fighting and stuff. And, and so I don't know, I I don't know where we go, but I also don't know that Bravo really has a plan, but I do think whether this is true or not, something is clearly going on because Bravo just announced all these like casting changes. We are currently in a housewives drought. I mean, this hasn't happened in a very long time. I mean, usually as new housewives are getting started, the old seasons are ending and we have these like jam packed weeks where we've got like three or four housewives on at once. And this is the first time where there's actually space where there are no housewives airing. And that's like pretty big and I think that's pretty telling because there's also not a lot that have been filming and so we're we're gonna be in this drought for the year and I'm I'm just a little I'm wondering what's really going on behind the scenes at Bravo because it seems like something much bigger is actually sort of happening well and I think it's telling too that we're in this drought coming off of like a couple of flop seasons Mm -hmm. of Housewives yeah you know like Beverly Hills I loved, I watched, but it was not kind of the Beverly Hills that we've known. You know, it was a a little bit of a darker, heavier season. And the, you know, the stupid little drama that Anna Marie tried, you know, tried to stir up was not engaging at all. It was not compelling. So that was, watched it because I'm invested, love them, you know, watching the Kyle Mauricio marriage fall apart you know, very invested in all of this stuff. So we're still tuning in, but it's like, it it wasn't giving what it normally gives. And then Potomac has just been in crisis the last two seasons, just so not the same show. I mean, Potomac used to be my favorite show Um, of all the franchises was I think the top. And now it's like, I didn't even watch the episodes in real time because I just wasn't excited about what was going on. Yeah. Um, So it's, yeah, it's, and now a lot is kind of not, there's not really a lot in the, percolating in the pipeline. So I don't know what's going to happen. Well, and then you get like these like epic seasons, like we did with Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And then it's like, well, where do you go from here? And, you know, I just think that there, I don't know if they know, I don't know if they know how to find that magic again, which is why I put the last episode of the podcast together is because I, I think that like, we're holding on to like the old formats. We're holding, we're holding on to things rather than sort of embracing the new. And I think we really need to embrace something new and some kind of changes. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But speaking of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, another sort of breaking news is that amid the, uh, uh, they were filming for this upcoming season, I think it was just, I want to say that it was just in the last week or two, I heard that Mary Cosby had been upgraded to a full-time housewife for this upcoming season and that she was going to be fully rejoining the cast again. Um, And then we get news that she, that there was controversy and that there is feuding now among, among the cast with her because she referred to Lisa Barlow's son, our little baby gorgeous as the R word. To speak of somebody's child, 
like that in front of cameras is abhorrent to say the least. But just going back to the beginning, like why they would make Mary a full-time housewife and not bring Monica back oh, as yeah. a full-time housewife is just mistake number one. Like, well, And I'm going to say this is like last season – uh, and maybe this feels controversial with now the news coming out about her using this kind of slur, but the she was enjoyable to watch as a friend of because she was because uh, she is unhinged. And I think even Andy said, like, Mary, you like just say whatever it is that's on your mind. And she's like, thank you. Like, and it's like, <laughs> you're unclear if that was a compliment. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, and there is something about it where you're like, oh, like, she does say whatever she wants and it's like, it's borderline rude and disrespectful. Like when she tells Heather gay that she thinks that she looks inbred and Heather gay is just kind of like laughs it off. And we, as the viewer laugh it off too. And it's like, okay, that's like, I guess what she's good for is that she's like kind of this comic relief, but like in a way that's like really borderline. And honestly, the way that Ramona always was too, where Ramona did things and you were like, oh my God, that's so like not okay. But it's kind of funny that she just said that to that person's face. But what are you expecting though? You give this person a platform and you know that they say problematic things. They're going to say problematic things and you can't then all of a sudden be like, oh, I'm so shocked. Right. And it's kind of like the double-edged sword of the premise of this show to begin with. Right. It it is exactly the the problem and fatal flaw of Ramona, which is she's was one of the most watchable housewives for the longest time because you did not know what she was going to say or do next. And she can't help but be who she is. You know, there's no ability for her or someone like Mary to self-produce because they just don't have the self-awareness and they don't have that thing that other people have, which is you think before you speak and think about maybe how something's going to make somebody else feel. But to say that about somebody's child is a whole different level of really uncomfortable nastiness. So I hope it's like, I hope it's grounds for her firing because that's just disgusting, but she's, she's mean. She's been one of the meanest people that's been on these shows. I, she said that about Heather, that she looks inbred, which it's tough to watch Heather just sort of laugh off these insults. Like she was friends with Jen Shaw for so long after she called her, called Shrek. her Shrek in a not joking or funny way. Yeah. So it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. But I watched um, Mary on Watch What Happens Live with Z-Way, mm-hmm. which was funny because Z-Way's whole show is trying to make people uncomfortable on camera. Right. And Z-Way just looked so visibly uncomfortable sitting next to Mary because Mary was saying things like, oh, Heather shouldn't be wearing Gucci because they don't make Gucci in her size and was dead serious. Wasn't trying to be funny. Wasn't trying to land, you know, a controversial take. Was just saying like, they don't make Gucci in that size. So we know this person to be mean. We know her to be nasty. In these small doses, it's like you can kind of sort of laugh some of the stuff off as shade, but it's clearly gone too far. Oh, yeah. If this is true. No, I mean, reading it, I was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not surprised by this because like she was making controversial comments before she left the Housewives originally, like when she was on the first time around, she was saying things that were like, yeah, that's a really sort of like not okay thing to say, but we sort of laughed it off and we were focused more on something else that was happening with, you know, Jen Shah or someone more polarizing or whatever that was happening. So like Mary kind of like slid under the radar, Mm -hmm. but it's like, there's, there's some, I mean, yes, she's a mean person. I think she's a mean spirited person. And I think that she's mean to her core. Mean. And she's deeply unwell, deeply yeah. unwell. And it's hurtful to Lisa's son, like first and foremost, it's hurtful to her child, but it's hurtful to the show. Yeah. It's hurtful to the show to have people, to have her speak like that and have her just be able to flippantly just say something like that because we're asking as viewers and people who watch the show to say, share your lives, share your life with us, show yep. your family, yep. share your relationships. But now how can any of them really put their kids and their family on the show? If, if someone's going to say something like that. So it just, it, it creates also these problems for nobody's going to subject their children to be, yep. you know, spoken to like that. Absolutely. Well, I feel like that's oddly some good baseline for this next segment which is the time has come. We're there. (laughs) So for many seasons now, we have watched a feud between one Miss Teresa Judice and the other Team Gorga. 
The two Gorgas. <laughs> At times it's Gorgas. just Melissa. Sometimes it's Joe and Melissa. But we have watched this feud play out for years on camera. And this is deep-rooted, deep-seated feud between these two family members, which is a which is a different dynamic for Housewives as well, which always made it kind of compelling television. I think over the last few seasons, it has become less compelling to watch these two continue to fight in a horrible way. And now we know going into this new season, which is about to premiere, um, that they don't film together, that we are going to have two very different groups of people that we're going to watch. And this is, I mean, really unprecedented for, for Bravo and for Housewives. So, I thought it was only fitting because I know I have I have been called a tree stump. I have been called <laughs> team tree. I have been called a tree hugger. A tree hugger. I have been called all kinds of things in support of my Teresa on this podcast before. But I've never had anyone actually come and try to justify why Melissa is such a garbage human. And I thought that <laughs> <laughs> I thought that if anyone could do it, it would be you. And so why don't you start us out and just explain to me your side of why you feel like you trust and believe in Team Melissa. Okay. Well, we're starting all wrong because none of this is based in trust and beliefs. Which I trust no one. I trust none of these women and you shouldn't either. If you trust Teresa, you are starting from the wrong square. Absolutely. I am with you on that. <laughs> I, okay. It's, I don't know where to start. I think... I I think at the core, the, the baseline issue that I have has nothing to do with storyline mm -hmm. and who's making better television or who's giving more story. Obviously, if you just objectively look at the two of them and what they've contributed to the show, the person who continues to marry criminals is the one that's going to give better <laughs> television. Like, obviously, she went to prison. Her husband went to prison. She's now financially tied herself to another alleged, you know, fraudster. So mm -hmm. like, it's not about who's giving better television. That's like, there's no question there. But uh, Teresa is delusional in a way that I can't connect with or understand at all. At all. I don't understand how you can just be so willfully ignorant to something that's just already hurt her and already hurt her family and that she's already experienced and she hasn't evolved out of that. So that's why I can't connect with Teresa in any way. I really don't. I think her kids are super sweet and those girls are really grounded, especially given what they've been through. And I like seeing her as a mom. I think she seems like a really sweet mother, but I just, I can't connect with that. She's living in a world that I do not understand a level of ignorance. That I don't understand with Melissa also delusional, but in ways that I get. She's delusional in ways that I understand. She is delusional in the sense that she like thinks she it looks like Jennifer Lopez. And she doesn't. <laughs> but like I get that. I also wake up and want to be JLo. She she built the whole studio because she thinks she's a pop star. Right. I very much want to do the same thing. And you've heard me sing. It sounds like, you know, a, a nails on a chalkboard. So I get, I can relate to like Melissa's delusion. I can relate to the things that she's idiotic about in some way. Whereas like, I, feel I can't like you're, land any plane with Teresa. I feel like you're picking a side based on the fact that you don't support the things that Teresa has done. So you kind of are like, well, Melissa's the less of two evils in the like, who made, who makes dumber decisions. It's not by default, though, because in their feud, I do agree with the Gorgas. I think it's tough to watch Teresa constantly victimize them and constantly be nasty to them and constantly blame the repercussions of her own choices on them. So in that sense, I am very much more actively on their side. Got like it. in this family dispute, I'm on their side. Because like you, you, you immediately broke down my whole defense. By starting it out and saying, like, it's not about who has delivered more to the show. Because I will say, like, there has never been... I mean, Teresa is one of the all-time greats. And I would maybe argue that she is the greatest housewife that we've ever had in terms of delivering storyline and show. She flipped the table. She put the housewives on a completely different map as, a, as the entire franchise of the, all the cities. You know, it really changed the game. She was this polarizing character that you loved, but you also sort of were like, wow, she's like fiery and she has a temper and, 
you know, she was, you know, spending cash with or spending cash money that ultimately landed her in jail. <laughs> and, you know, she just did things that were so absurd and, um, and she was like funny about it. Like she had like such, such a light about her when she first came on the show. And then, you know, there was all, and so, you know, she went to prison, she had children, she got married, she got divorced, she had her husband deported. She has had so much on that show. Whereas like, when you look at like, what has Melissa's storyline been and Joe's storyline, it's like pretty much just been about Teresa. And that when it's not about them, when you can tell that they've sort of like had this conversation preseason to be like, oh, let's not talk about Teresa this season. Let's like make our own thing. They're like, oh, we'll like have a, another baby or I'm going to find my long lost sister or I'm going to like, and it's these like outlandish storylines that you hear about and then you never hear about again. We're going to open a business, a pizza parlor or something. And like it opens in some strip mall and then you never see it or hear about it again. Cause you know, that thing closed a week later. Like, it's the storylines just aren't giving authenticity. And to me, that is where like I firmly am more team Teresa than Melissa. And so I think that like you and I are, are arguing two different points because I actually agree with you. I agree with you in that like Teresa continues to make these mistakes and it becomes hard to watch as a viewer. So I can get on board with that. I think that, who though is the better pick for the show? And that's where I go team Teresa, because I'm like, I want to watch someone who's going to deliver authentic storyline over someone who's not. Okay. I will then argue this point because I agree. <laughs> we have different reasons for why we're on different sides, Yes, but I think Teresa is worse for the show than Melissa. I don't disagree that her Melissa's storylines are dumb. It's stupid. Like it's the equivalent of Megan King Edmonds being like, we're going to Ireland to find my relatives. It's right. like, it's right. so stupid. We're smarter than that as viewers. We know you're not going to like do 23 and me and find your long lost sister. <laughs> and we know you're not having another baby. Your kids are in high school. Like it's not happening. You're running in your basement. Like that's the most you have going on right now. Yeah. So I, I get that. I do get that. But I do think Teresa is worse for the show because she is now stuck in this. She feels like she's too big for the show. Or she feels like she's too central to the show that she is running the show. Mm -hmm. And that's when these things start to go downhill. Yep. It's when it becomes like if you don't just blindly agree with her and show blind loyalty to her, she will not film with you. Or if she'll film with you, but she will not engage with you. And so that's what puts this in the show in such a gridlock is because if it's not her turn, she won't go along with it until you just like crumble and give in, which is I think what we're going to see Jackie do. Because Jackie was one of the first people to really stand up to her. Mm -hmm. So I, I think she's worse for the show in that sense. Because it becomes like what happened with Nini and what happened with Vicky. Where it's like you have to also be willing to engage with the people that you do not like. Yeah. That's well, part that's, of the, the show. That's why Candace is gone. I mean, she couldn't, yeah, she couldn't right. engage. And I agree with you. And Andy himself has said the way that they did Housewa this Jersey season is not sustainable. Like they are going to make a decision at the end of this. And one of those, if not both of them, are going to go. Like, it, it is not sustainable where they can continue to, like, not have any kind of scenes together. And that they, you know, I mean, at BravoCon, they had to do separate panels. They didn't even go them. on the same panel. So like, it's like, what is the – it doesn't seem sustainable. In my opinion, Teresa, because of the way that she is, which is making all of these really crazy decisions and continuing to live a life that – that seems like it might just land her in the exact same place that she's been just spin her off, give her her own show, give yeah. her a spin off. Let us see her life. Let us see Louie have the people around her that she wants to film with, see the kids, the girl, the, you know, the daughters and all that they're <laughs> up to, but it, it does. I just don't feel like it works. And I, I feel like that's more Teresa's fault than it is Melissa's fault. Okay. So let me ask you this then. Say that Bravo does that. They give Teresa her own show. Because I agree. She's a polarizing character. She's someone to watch. I have watched a lot of characters that I am not fans of. Okay? Like, I... So, like, I get that Teresa has some qualities that are not necessarily... Like, they don't always show in the best light. Now, who she is outside of the show, I don't want to speak to it because I've 
I have heard. I mean, people say that Andy Cohen, like Teresa is one of Andy Cohen's favorite housewives. You can tell. You can and, tell on watch in the reunions, watch he loves her. You can tell that he loves her. He and adores I, her. And I think it's because like, you know, even on that first season of Ultimate Girls Trip, like people are like, wow, Teresa's like a really sweet lady and she's like really nice and she's and like she's apparently really good to all of the producers and the cameramen and she like cooks for everybody. And like, she just has that sort of like Italian mentality of like, I'm going to take care of the people around me. Whereas like Melissa does not have that same reputation. And so my question to you is if Bravo gives Teresa their own spin, her own spinoff, do you want Melissa as a housewife? I would say let's spin Teresa off. Let's send her, you know, a little swan song into the night, into her own little <laughs> show over here. And then I think you keep Marge full time, uh, Jen Aiden full time. I say you give Melissa a chance at full time, if not friend of, because she does need to bring more. She, she needs to bring more. Um, who else is on the show? <laughs> I mean, right? Dolores, obviously. Oh, Dolores. You keep Dolores full time. We love Dolores. We yep. love her and Frank's little odd couple dynamic. And you build around that. Melissa, Dolores, Jenny, Rachel. Margaret. Danielle and Rachel, I'm not 100% in on yet. I need to see another season of them yep. and see where they land. But I think that's enough to build off of and build a show off of. Jen Aiden and Margaret bring it. And I think Dolores brings it enough. And I think maybe without the pressure of everything being tied to Teresa, maybe we could see a different side of Melissa and a different side of Melissa and Joe. Because we're only getting Melissa and Joe as adjacent to Teresa. Yeah, but I think without her, I think that that castle crumbles. I think that they- that might be true. I think they've ridden on her coattails all this time. I mean, the way that they came on the show, that they back-channeled their way into the show without even telling Teresa that they were trying to join, which is where this whole feud starts, by the way. Like, they just won't acknowledge even that, and Teresa lost her trust in them. I have no problem with the way they came on the show. Well, I mean, I I do. I have no issues with it. I think that it's shady. I think that if you're truly family and that's what you're all about, you call your sister and say, hey, my wife's going to be a housewife with you. Like, you give a heads up. You don't but make it a surprise. we've since learned things that have gone on before that point, and I do not begrudge them for not giving her any heads up. It sounds like Teresa was monstrous to them, monstrous to Melissa. Could you imagine your brother's wife coming over, bringing you cookies, and you throw them in the trash in yes, front of her? Yes, they're sprinkle cookies. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are sprinkle cookies. They belong in the trash. <laughs> they are garbage. I get why Teresa was... <laughs> pissed because they were not in a good place. They were pissed. So they came on the show for that exact purpose. There would have been no reason to bring them on the show if there was no deep seated family rivalry. Yeah. And the communion episode is one of the craziest episodes that there's been, I think, in the history of the show. So I don't disagree that everything has been sort of as something that's revolved around the feud between Joe Gorga and Teresa and Melissa and but I think that they've they have given enough. I think that they could have a, a chance to see what happens without that feud really being a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I'll be interested to see how this season goes because I think I agree with you. I think that like no, Teresa can't dictate. I don't think any housewife should be allowed to dictate who they film with and who they don't. You're either part of an ensemble cast or you're not. So I agree with you that like we've got to make a decision. And if Teresa's ultimately like, look, I got to go in my own way and I'm going to be on House of Villains and I'm going to go on Traders and I'm going to hopefully get my own show someday. Like if that's what the route she wants to go, I mean, she's hanging at Coachella with, with Taylor, um, you know, she's winning. <laughs> best, best picture of all time. <laughs> <laughs> she is like, then that's what they should do. I don't think that Melissa has what it takes to be a housewife. I don't know that she ever really did. I think that she was always just Teresa's sister-in-law. And I think without Teresa, she's really nobody in that group. And so, yeah, I I would be interested, but maybe I will feel differently after this new season because we will see Melissa at least attempt to be without Teresa. Although I have heard from folks that have like seen a couple of the first episodes that Teresa has no, that she doesn't talk about Joe and Melissa. There's like, She's clearly living a completely different life and that Joe and Melissa are still very much talking about their sister, Teresa. 
Well, then that I think is going to speak for itself because I, I do agree that they have to establish their own place on the show outside of the Teresa feud, yeah. because it's also, I think we're all, I don't, I, it seems like obviously Bravo agrees the format's not going to be sustainable. You can't have season after season where it's just split into two separate groups because what is that? That's no show, but um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's nowhere to really go from that. I mean, you can only, I mean, last year, I kind of already thought that they were doing this like split thing a little too much. And so to really dig in and say like, we are doing, I mean, I think that there's even like separate trips and things like there's really, that's, I think, well, one of, there was something about the Berkshires trip. They were supposed to go to Dorinda's house as, and something happened, but like, I think that it was also like, I had heard that there was like some logistical things where it was like the, the two people couldn't be, the two groups couldn't be together. And it's like, that just sounds like a nightmare. And yeah, I, I don't know how the, how it'll all feel like one sort of cohesive show, but I, I am interested. I'm interested to see, you know, the dynamics change. I'm interested to see if Joe and Melissa can stand on their own. And then maybe we, you know, go from here. But I, I think what I'm taking away from this is that the feud between Teresa and Melissa runs very deep and we won't solve that here today, nor nor will anyone ever really. But the feud between you and I is actually not much of one because we actually agree with each other's stances. We're just on different sides of that. Like, I agree with you that Teresa needs to stop going after all the same things that could land her in trouble and stop making the same mistakes over and over and stop trying to dictate the show and be the the focal point and the star. I also agree that Melissa brings nothing to the show and that she has no storyline. Sounds like you agree with all of those things. So maybe we found some some common ground going into the new season. I think we have some common ground. I, I think with Teresa, it seems like we are kind of in for a recycled storyline because of her decisions, where it's going to be another season of people accusing Louie of some shady financial behavior and maybe stealing from her. And it's going to be the same exhausting shtick of no, he didn't. No, deny, deny, deny until, you know, one day we'll potentially see him in handcuffs again. But I do agree that Melissa and Joe, if they can't really bring anything outside of just talking about Teresa and talking about the feud, then there's nothing left because we have to be done with that. We have to yeah. be done with this feud. And yeah. as viewers, it it was sad. It was hard to watch last season. I hate watching the kids be involved and watch, you know, the kids be upset about it and watch Joe Gorga fight with his niece. Like, it's just hard yeah. to watch. It's sad. It's like, you don't want to watch real deep pain in people and see these deep dark, fissures yeah. happen in a family. So I think we all want to be done with a feud. I'm curious to see where we go from here. I hope that Melissa and Joe can maybe pull a little bit more tricks up their sleeve. I did see that it looks like he attacked someone at a child's wrestling meet. So maybe <laughs> we'll see that on the show. <laughs> oh, well, we can only hope, right? <laughs> Yeah, he, he's a he's a real stand-up character. Um, but yes, no. Well, I hope that we ended on good terms in this because, I, you know, oftentimes when we bring up Jersey, it's like you and I immediately go to the jugular of the ter- Teresa versus the Melissa. But I feel like we have found common ground today and I feel like maybe we can actually ch- chat civilly about this upcoming season. This season is going to be our truest test. I feel good about it. We we've made it out of this discussion unscathed. I agree. I think so, that this is. I think this is progress. I think we have a bright Jersey season ahead. Well, all right. Let's not go there. I, <laughs> I don't know that. I'm not putting all of my eggs in that basket yet. I still think it's, uh, you know, it's still time will tell. I like I said, it seems very strange setup for this season, but I'm excited to see it nonetheless. Same. Likewise. Well, I just love chatting all things, all things, all things with you, but I also love chatting all things pop culture and Bravo with you always. So thank you again for, for coming back and and doing it with me and doing another pop culture roundup. Thank you for having me. I have to say it's a, it's a deep honor to be a two-time guest now. I mean, there's not a lot of them and I'm, I'm already hoping that you're going to be a third. I, well, let's see what happens with Jersey. Yeah, we will. We will I dissect mean, Jersey. Maybe we'll come back, back at the end, end of the season and say, where do we stand? I was just going to say I might be back at the end of the season. I might insist on coming on again to to see where we land, where well, this plane lands. 
I'm already I'm already scheduling it. <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you so much for doing it. Um, and for all of you, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for you know listening to me and one of my best friends ramble on about Tori Spelling and loaded baked potatoes and our feud between Melissa and Teresa. Um, and don't forget to rate and subscribe so that you never miss an episode of The Gist. And then you can follow me at CM Vetrano on all the socials. And Emily's not like a social, super social kind of gal. Um, otherwise, I'd tell her to plug hers. But um, if you really want to follow her, your best bet is to follow me because I'm going to give you some real Emily content. She was talking about her singing voice earlier. There might even be some like Emily and song on, on a story to come soon. You're going to lose <laughs> listeners if you do that. <laughs> I disagree. Um, so that's going to do it for this episode of The Gist. Thank you, Emily, for being here. Thank you guys for listening. And until next week, it's Chris Vetrano. Bye. Bye.